It is time for us to talk about language. When we talk about organizations, what words do we use? Does it matter that we have a shared language? And what happens when we don't? Simone has developed a common protocol for organizing that addresses the challenges of forming a shared language. He is a local talent joining us here from Rome as the CEO of Boundaryless, a fir and he is a firm believer in platformization. So please give a warm welcome to Simone, our closing keynote. Thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for staying uh, up until the last uh, talk of the three days. I'm fortunate I couldn't join you from the very start uh, two days ago uh, because of other obligations. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm very uh, thankful to the organizers for giving me the, the possibility to offering this closing keynote. Um, it has been a pleasure uh, to prepare it and a honor. I've been following uh, an intersection group and EDGES uh, work for a few uh, months or years, um, also because of the significant uh, uh, impact that uh, this nice community is having on the conversation on uh, organizing, which has been, uh, you know, always in my priorities uh, as, a, as a consultant and an entrepreneur. So I will try to offer um, some kind of, uh, uh, I would say, probably also less technical uh, conversation as a closing. And I hope that uh, some of the questions that I raise at the end of the presentation will uh, uh, be meaningful for uh, the development of the discourse uh, of this uh, fantastic community. Um, sorry if I am, um, I will be reading a little bit of my notes because I couldn't, uh, uh, you know, I wrote this uh, keynote a few days ago, but I, I didn't have enough time to kind of memorize it well, so I want to be sure that I convey the message that I was hoping for. So okay, you, you can hear me well like this, right? Yeah, okay. So first of all, let me say a couple of words about me. I have a, a couple of decades experience in uh, uh, all things ecosystems. Uh, first, I was working uh, um, you know, as a consultant uh, in promoting open source uh, adoption in the early 2000s. Uh, then I've been working in telco for a long time, and telco was a little bit of the uh, hot spot uh, for platforms and ecosystems in the early 2010. So I learned a lot. And then uh, eventually I, I, I've been working as an advisor to startups, a consultant to large organizations all around adopting uh, uh, ecosystemic and open organizational models. Uh, so that's it. I've been uh, uh, in the last uh, a few years, I've been the CEO of Boundaryless and uh, creator of Platform Design Toolkit. Boundaryless, it's uh, uh, more or less the combination of 10 years of work uh, around uh, open uh, models, uh, uh, around uh, platform thinking. So uh, I've been you know, tra um, reaching more than 100,000 users that have been using our methodologies. We have been training all over the world, more than 1,000 people and countless customers and adopters have been thankfully working with us. Uh, two major uh, frameworks that we created. One is the Platform Design Toolkit, fairly, fairly you know, largely adopted as a, a set of design tools for designing marketplaces, ecosystems, software platforms, uh, and uh, uh, most uh, lately, the 3EO Toolkit, uh, which is uh, um, a toolkit, toolkit that you can use to implement what we call the platform organization model. Talk about this a little bit more in the coming minutes. So um, I've been always passionate about open source because essentially I like the idea that uh, uh, we don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, open source was a little bit older age in the early 2000s. And um, you know, I remember that we uh, discussed a lot uh, about uh, um, uh, you know, uh, convincing someone to not to reinvent the wheel and kind of adopt uh, uh, you know, shared domain models, shared data models, uh, which, uh, of course, come inherited when you adopt a certain open source product, right? So you, you have to compromise a little bit. And um, uh, I, I remember that in the early 2000s, uh, we were talking about, you know, building uh, mechanisms to allow people to 
uh, not to exit, but rather to speak their voice and uh, become loyal uh, to projects. Uh, this is a very famous framework uh, from uh, Hirschman. Um, things actually went a little quiet on open source after the early 2000s. If you remember, I mean, there was a much more lively discussion around free software and open source of those days. And uh, as we will see later, open source has kind of become uh, a strategic market uh, penetration tool. Uh, and for example, you know, Google is a good example with its uh, Open Handset Alliance. That was the first step that uh, uh, allowed Google to bring Android to the masses and, and now you know, conquered more than 80% of the market. And, um, um, oh. and um, uh, I was also very much um, excited when at the end of the uh, 2010, we have witnessed uh, this new technology coming up, the crypto space, uh, web, what people call Web3. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but essentially, you know, the promises of uh, a blockchain enabled systems and these token systems that uh, have been, you know, pioneered and, and prototyped was a little bit of an answer to uh, the typical dynamics that exist when platforms uh, are developed and brought to the market. So typically, uh, these giant platforms first uh, attract the users and then over time extract value from the ecosystems, being it uh, um, you know, uh, users or partners. Typically, they cooperate at first and then compete. A good example could be like, for example, Amazon creates you know, tools for people to create their products and suddenly comes up with a much more competitive version of the same product that the ecosystem has been creating and captures all the value uh, from it. So to counter these dynamics, um, uh, crypto and Web3, and these, by the way, are pictures from, mostly from uh, Chris Dixon, uh, uh, who has uh, just released a very interesting book uh, uh, that you can check it out, but essentially, you know, this new movement, you know, the Web3 crypto movement uh, brought up new tools that uh, were very promising and uh, kind of uh, uh, gave us uh, the idea that uh, we could, uh, um, uh, we could uh, uh, really build alternatives um, to uh, typical approaches that platforms have and uh, uh, basically gave us a possibility to leverage on new new tools, for example, uh, uh, advanced governance uh, mechanisms like uh, the ones that you see mentioned here, where people can actually participate to digital uh, voting systems and you know, make their voice heard through uh, very tangible mechanisms. Uh, also, the fact that uh, uh, with crypto you have a possibility to create these token economies, and so you, you can leverage even on, you know, kind of, uh, uh, monetary systems, you know, for example, you can say, uh, I want to start a new system, and uh, for the people that trust the system at the very start, when there are no network effects and, you know, the platform is still in the infancy, you can give them financial advantages, you know, you can give them tokens that uh, motivate them to participate in the very early stage. So, what, what, what I'm, why am I talking about this? Uh, essentially because, uh, uh, Web3 has, you know, since then, uh, you know, provided a lot of very interesting projects. And for example, here you, you see mentioned, you know, some uh, very low, uh, low level projects like, uh, for example, the Cosmos ecosystem that is a very inclusive uh, ecosystem for, uh, you know, um, transactions management or the demo, uh, which is a very interesting uh, community and uh, uh, technology that allows people to create data on EV uh, batteries performance and share it and sell it to, to third parties. Uh, and so basically people that drive, drive cars can monetize their, uh, their data. Uh, you know, lots of things. And, and especially I think it's um, interesting to look at what happened to the, as an example, I would say, to the social media um, uh, ecosystem in crypto. And uh, um, these are some examples of uh, um, uh, you know, this is particularly one example of a so-called protocol for social media in, in Web3. And as you can see, the, the promise is, it was that uh, we could build protocols 
that different applications can use and so basically they can share some common language and uh, um, in this way you don't have to basically reinvent the, the, the protocol itself. You can, you can adopt an existing protocol uh, as an app developer and uh, for example your users could at some point decide to use another solution without maybe losing entirely their data and, uh, and their um, transactions. So, it was a promising, promising technology, but at the end of the day, if you look at the Web3 ecosystem in social media, for example, basically everybody's reinventing the protocol. So we ended up, instead of, uh, you know, there are tools to converge, there are possibilities to share governance transparently, you can invest, you can be uh, part of a shared system much more easily, but still, people are reinventing the wheel. Still, people are reinventing the protocol. They don't just use existing protocols, they want to reinvent it from, from scratch. As you can see, there are so many social media protocols, even in Web3. So the question is, why we disagree? And um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I had uh, my friend Alberto Brandolini on my podcast. Alberto is, if you don't know him, is a in kind of an internet celebrity, you know, for his uh, uh, Brandolini's law. Um, uh, which states that uh, to refuse bullshit, you need uh, uh, um, an order uh, of magnitude of amount of uh, energy, uh, then you need it for creating bullshit on the internet. It's very interesting law. And, but by the way, Alberto is famous for, not just for the Brandolini's law, but uh, for even storming that I guess most of you have been heard about, ha have heard about. And uh, he told me something very interesting in this podcast, he said, uh, uh, reaching an agreement is one of the most sophisticated and expensive activities of human beings. Um, essentially, Alberto was making the point that uh, consensus has a cost, and sometimes it's just better to visualize uh, disagreement instead of trying to make everybody agree on something, right? And um, um, what is the point that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that I want to make here? Is that, uh, um, um, you know, uh, how can I say, besides the, 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 the implicit difficulty of building agreements, we also have to ponder that uh, sometimes there are other motivations that push people to create something new. They can be, for example, financial motivations. You can say, you know, uh, I, can, I can collect capital if I create something new, for example. Or just people want to creatively express themselves. And even if it's convenient, it makes sense, they just reinvent things because it's their a way to express their uniqueness. So uh, within time, you know, um, still the market has been finding ways to uh, converge into standards and agree into standards. And these are some examples. This is what, for example, and Android, uh, as I said before, Google um, achieved with Android, and uh, uh, Android was uh, very convenient for OEMs to adopt. But over time, you know, Android, uh, Google find a way to control the ecosystems by uh, generating network effects on the, uh, on the App Store and then basically obliging everybody using the free version of Android to also use their own services to have access to the marketplace of applications. So as you can see, you know, uh, commercial entities still find ways to achieve standardization, but more from a strategic perspective. And this is also the, of course, the example of AWS, as I said before. So Amazon achieved some kind of uh, uh, standard positioning in the market through effectiveness, ease of use, uh, ubiquitousness, the fact that all these systems are pay as you go, is basically easy, cheap, and effective to use them. So it's not really an intentional convergence on a standard, but it's more rather uh, something that is convenient for, for people to use. And of course, you know, technology is, pro is uh, progressing and uh, in the background, we are seeing a lot of uh, uh, solutions and technologies that allow us to compose our systems, to find a way to wrap our differences around wrappers or connectors and so on. So no, no code, for example, is all the rage. AI now is emerging as some sort of uh, universal duct tape that you can use to duct things together. And so 
we still can speak a different language, but we're gonna find a way to wrap our things together. So that's the message. So, but the point is, is this really progressing? So we wrap things around because we want to maintain our optionality. We don't, we, we, we don't want to, to cut our choices and our options. We rather want to say, okay, let's wrap things together, but still I will keep my optionality, I will keep my possibility to do what I want. But despite that this is an interesting dynamic, so this, the fact that the market is breaking down into smaller pieces and we're gonna find a way to wrap them together, I don't feel, I don't feel that this is really uh, meaning um, progress. And why I, what, I'm, what is the case that I'm, that I'm seeing, that I'm making here? I'm gonna use a metaphor for you to um, think through this. Um, almost 400 years ago, uh, uh, Diogenes uh, lived a life of uh, deprivation and uh, he was basically wandering around in a barrel and uh, uh, this uh, self-imposed uh, stark asceticism you know, basically gave him uh, the possibility to um, go around and, and uh, um, basically um, giving the moral authority to point out that uh, the society was hypocritical and superficial and uh, um, you know, in no way uh, people were seeking the truth. You know, it was a kind of a very corrupt and degenerate society. So Diogenes had to uh, basically strip himself of uh, attachments to send uh, such a clear, powerful message. Okay, so it was some kind of sacrifice he had to take to tell people that uh, they were not going for the truth, that they were uh, very superficial and degenerate. So similar dynamics exist, for example, in uh, information theory. So in information theory, if you want to communicate with someone efficiently, uh, it costs you energy to do so. So for example, to uh, uh, identify signal from noise, you basically have two options. One option is to either use more energy, so send a stronger signal, or just reduce the options that you have. So maybe you just agree that you're gonna use a number of symbols, and it makes it easy for people to extract such information from the noise that they receive. Just because you sacrifice your options, you say instead of sending any kind of signal I want, I'm gonna use this alphabet, this set of symbols that I'm gonna share with you. So in a few words, if we want to collaborate deeply and seriously, something has to give. Okay, so there is no free lunch in collaboration. And uh, this is uh, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about that if we really want to collaborate, uh, there needs to be some sort of intentional collaboration. There needs to be some sort of intentional uh, way that we, we share skin in the game into each other, that uh, um, we uh, basically go through this process of agreeing, uh, which has a cost, but it's essential to reap the benefit of a collaboration. So ultimately, this means solidarity, companionship, and shared objectives. So in the background of what uh, I'm describing here, um, we are seeing uh, emerging a common model of organizing. So the, the, the reduction of transaction costs, the fact that uh, it's now much easier to uh, collaborate through uh, to interfaces, let's say, that. Uh, as I said before, plugging things together is much easier because of technology. We have seen um, a new approach to the organization emerge in the last 20 years. Bezos was a pioneer on this. And uh, for example, you will recall, of course, the API mandate that basically said at Amazon, you don't have to talk to each other. You just put a wrapper around the work you're doing, expose an interface, and this interface should be natively externalizable. This was a very powerful message. Basically, the organization stopped to be silos or hierarchies of management, but it became a set of nodes that could interact with each other, and uh, at some point, it was very easy to just be take a piece of the organization and swap it with, a, with an external partner. This was, for example, the choices that allowed Amazon to create AWS, because you, know, you take your IT 
organization and you externalize it and make it a product, or also uh, what made it possible for Amazon to move from uh, 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 an internal marketplace with internal categories into the big marketplace that they have now with external partners that sell every kind of things on the platform. And we are, we are now into um, uh, an age where you can actually rent uh, cloud teams outside of your co company. For example, this, is, uh, um, this uh, startup uh, uh, A-team uh, allows you to rent uh, teams uh, uh, from the outside or um, uh, at a point where people like Sam Altman are saying that you can have a one person, uh, dollar, uh, one person billion dollar company. What is, what is the point that I'm raising? This is the framework that we built uh, for you to design what we call the platform organization. And the platform organization is very simple. It's essentially a product organization made of nodes, micro-entrepreneurial nodes that have a clear value proposition, interact with each other, and have use maybe shared services and talk to each other mainly through agreements and contracts. So you take the, the very old idea of the organization as a, a hierarchy and, and you know, long chains of command, and you break it down into nodes that are very independent, that are autonomous, manage their own PNL, have agreements with each other, and use the shared services. So this is happening beyond uh, Amazon. Many, many companies are now adopting these mechanics because of how technology has transformed markets and because of the team and the units have become the strongest force in the organization. So the point is, and here I'm, I'm pretty much done, the point is, uh, will our organizations that for ages have refused to collaborate on products and workflows suddenly understand that they need to share an organizational grammar? You know, and why is that? Because you know, there are some pressing issues uh, in the market, in society, that are um, pushing our organizations to cooperate. So there is a clear uh, need for our organization to share a grammar in terms of how do they agree, how do they expose their services, how, do, how can their units make contracts and collaborations beyond the organizational border. But the question is, Will they do? Will they do that? Will, they, uh, will these organizations understand that uh, they need to start collaborating over a shared language? So, and this is the last question that I want to leave you with for the next year, maybe. Uh, the question is, what is Edgy's role in this? Can Edgy really be, uh, go beyond facilitating conversations and maybe start to facilitate transactions and agreements between organizations, or at least what does it mean to build uh, edgy in this and uh, intersection group in this uh, context? You know, what is the role that this community can have in facilitating these kind of uh, uh, inter-organizational conversations? That's it. Thank you so much for your, for your interest, and uh, thank you for, for your time. Thank you so much, Simon. Any comments or questions? There we go. Thank you, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, my question is, uh, is there anything about, uh, what is it about edgy that uh, uh, makes you uh, think that this is better suited to deal with this, uh, this problem you're talking about? Well, I mean, again, I'm very curious to, to see what uh, um, this presentation or this conversation around, uh, uh, you know, the, an emerging uh, standard and, you know, basically common model of organizing brings to the, uh, to the uh, edge community. You know, so far, my uh, understanding is that uh, uh, tools like edge have been used mainly for internal stakeholders in an organizations to uh, collaborate. So the question would be, should edge maybe extend its reach into modeling uh, uh, these kind of organizational models and agreements, or maybe Maybe we should use Edgy to make the case for, um, um, you know, kind of creating uh, ways for different organizations to uh, transact and agree and collaborate. So 
I think in general that the edge community is part of a general discourse on uh, uh, standards and, and conversations. So maybe my provocation would be, um, you know, for edgy and for anybody that is into this space, um, how do you really uh, uh, facilitate this process of sharing an ontology between, between uh, entities? You know, because of course we can share, uh, you know, uh, Again, and this is a good point, this is a, a good step. We can share a, a basic understanding of how an organization is made with products, identities, and so on. But the point is, uh, how do we facilitate these uh, um, uh, kind of sacrifice so that we really use a common language and we can really start collaborating uh, you know, beyond uh, conversations, you know, into more, um, I would say, more ambitious uh, integrations between organizations. Thank you. Well, then, it, you had a question? Of course. I think um, the collaboration part, mm -hmm. contracts, and what do we, what do the businesses exchanges, mm -hmm. and I think it's the same asset that we are trying to modelize into in organizations, but this, these assets travel to organizations. But in EDGY, I don't know if we have anything to talk about the exchanges. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a thought. Yeah, you mean like service models, business models, and contracts? Yeah, why not? I mean, that could be an extension. There's a question over there. Over there. Well, f thank you for the inspiration. Um, I, th I think you touch a super interesting topic. Um, I know that there is like modern organizations who kind of model this, like Haya and others, yeah. um, where basically internal um, uh, capabilities compete with the market mm -hmm. um, so the discussion is less about contracting but about who provides the best service and they will survive yeah um, yet at least in my reality um, a lot of platform business is about making good contracts and um, I do believe that edgy could help to facilitate these discussions because they will be more structured um, yet big question mark for me is uh, in terms of partnering usually there's this principle of um, of power so if you're not in a power position you don't partner with somebody else right mm -hmm. because otherwise you will be submitted, submitted to their uh, requests and um, maybe this is just a very narrow perspective i have and i wonder what your experience is with um, platformed organizations where you partner with like for example, big telecoms who are in a very strong position. Mm -hmm. um, is there any approaches to that to kind of um, level the power disparities? Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in general, and I get to, uh, I want to resonate with your point, and a lot of the work we are doing is inspired by uh, Heyer. Uh, actually, Heyer is one of our, the, the partner with whom we, we have developed this methodology. Uh, for those that are um, uh, curious, you can check our website and you find 3EO and you will see uh, what I'm talking about. But essentially contracts are very, I, I think there is a, a very important point on contracts that they can really be used uh, to solve the issue that you mentioned. So uh, writing a good contract is very much a way to balance power structures, right? And this doesn't mean, uh, it cannot uh, be used only between organizations. But for example, if you look into um, Emery's work on the open systems theory, right? A lot of the um, work that Emery did was also pointing out that uh, you need clear agreements between, uh, between the players in the organization. So for example, suddenly, when an organization invests, for example, into a new venture, and powers an employee to take uh, uh, leadership on this new venture. And uh, um, this happens not through an assignment that can be removed at any point, but rather through a contract 
that, for example, exp um, uh, clarifies that if you reach a certain objectives, you can, for example, receive equity of this new venture. In our experience, this really transformed the organization from a laissez-faire you know, system into something that really has the capability to deal with uh, uh, the challenges that we are seeing in the market. Essentially, it transforms the organization into an entrepreneurial uh, system that respects the employee as a peer of the organization and not as a subordinate cog uh, in the machine. So that's, I, I think, a good point. Contracts are key into really solving these power structure issues. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, about your question, can Edgy help for this type of model? My first question would be, can you model trust? Because these type of models, they are born from a distrust from a certain type of power, right? When we were in 2008, 2009, the very reason why the market crashed was not functional. It's because nobody could trust their neighbors to do a transaction because everybody thought, are you unbankrupt? And I just don't know it. So I think this type of transparency that you're trying to build to these type of models, um, the fact that it can be transparent on the trust factor, if we can even model this, this could be interesting to explore because it has the purpose, the capabilities, and the experience factor. But then again, can you model trust? Um, this is, to me, this is a huge challenge and to, for it to be scalable, these type of models. Mm -hmm. The fact that these enterprises, you know, the banks or Amazon, as you were referring, they're not perfect, but they have been existing, they're clear, and they are known to the public. This is something that deep in our minds will always be there. And whenever you go to a new system, new organization, or new way of organizing yourselves, you have to be able to let people know you can trust us better than the other model. To me, that's the number one challenge. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, a quick point that, again, you can follow up if you are interested. In the Web3 space, um, there is a, a way of uh, describing organizational systems as a mix of two major things. They, some, some, some of the people in Web3 call them, on one side, socialware, and on the other side, trustware. So essentially, while socialware is what you cannot really encode in a piece of software, right? So it's the how we communicate, how we take decisions, for example, how we you know, create a common understanding of problems and issues. On the other hand, you have a rather important aspect that is normally not really um, codified in existing organizations. That, that's what they call trustware. And uh, essentially, it's what you can encode in clear, agreements, and in the blockchain space, in the Web3 space, we are talking about smart contracts that can actually execute themselves. So for example, you can imagine having a contract that uh, captures information from the market and uh, in a univocal way executes some kind of uh, rules you know, based on the information you capture from the market. So I think when we talk about trust, uh, as we move forward, we have to look into trust as a twofold uh, issue. One is what you can really codify into clear agreements that cannot be enforced if not by what's happening in reality. You know, it, it cannot be enforced by someone coming in and saying, you know, this agreement doesn't count anymore. That's an important point. So that's what we call trustware. And then you have socialware that is much more about how we build shared understanding, responsibility, ownership, and accountability through communication. So I think this could be a good, uh, um, you know, um, in, uh, impetus for us to start thinking our organizations as two layers, right? One is the more uh, autonomous, self-executing, and one is the more social and, uh, you know, uh, informal, intangible layer. And with that, yes. we wrap up. Yes. And we thank you once again for sharing your great thank ideas. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, good luck everybody from the community. And thank you again for the opportunity. Beautiful.